Should be okay. All right. Um, so I was asked to give a talk about how to train neural networks effectively. Um, this is a topic I haven't really given any talks about before. So the content is kind of um, pulled together from various experiences over the years. I hope at least some of it will be be useful to all of you. I, I uh, very much welcome uh, feedback about uh, the contents of this talk. Um, I'll give you my contact details uh, at the end. Um, so Francesca has already introduced me. Uh, I just want to give a quick overview of some of the work that I've done over the years. So the, um, in 2014, I was working on music recommendation during my PhD and I did an internship at Spotify. Um, and then uh, in 2015, I got distracted by, well, actually, this was also 2014. I got distracted by Kaggle. So um, I had a very hands up supervisor who was happy for me to just spend a lot of time on uh, Kaggle, which is this uh, platform for data science competitions. And I would say my main credentials for giving this talk about how to train neural networks are probably because of that experience and not so much because of my time at DeepMind. So uh, Kaggle is really what taught me what matters and how you get neural networks to perform uh, the best in the shortest amount of time. So most of what I'm gonna be talking about is actually maybe based more on that experience than, than the kind of work that I've been doing at DeepMind. Although obviously it's helped me a lot in my career uh, since then. Uh, so I did this Kaggle competition on uh, galaxy morphology prediction and then ended up writing a paper about that and then ended up having to include that in my thesis to be able to graduate. So my thesis is like mostly music information retrieval and then also astronomy. Um, and then in uh, 2015, I uh, also joined DeepMind over the summer. And then one of the, actually the, the first project I worked on was AlphaGo. That was in full swing then. And I had the opportunity to actually apply some of the techniques that I developed in the context of these Kaggle competitions to the neural networks used in AlphaGo. And it turned out that that didn't really work at all, but they were kind enough to put my name on the paper anyway. So that was nice. Uh, and then the, the sort of the first um, project that I felt was sort of really one of my own was the WaveNet project uh, together with my colleague, uh, Aaron Vandenort, who has also actually studied uh, at the same lab, did his PhD in the same lab. And we worked on a generative model for raw audio. I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in the context of the talk as well. Um, I've done a lot of collaborations with a team uh, called Magenta at uh, Google Brain, now also part of Google DeepMind. Uh, they work a lot on music, so I've collaborated with them on a, on a few uh, things. I'm not going to go through all of these in detail. Um, done some work on, uh, uh, on text-to-speech with uh, adversarial models. Um, some work on representation learning. Most recently, my most recent paper is actually a, a diffusion model for language. Uh, the conclusion of that work was it kind of works, but it's going to take a while before we can dethrone auto aggression. Um, anyway, that's kind of a summary of, of what I've been up to in my eight years of DeepMind and also a little bit before then uh, during my PhD. Um, so this is an overview of this talk. So I was asked to talk about how to train neural networks effectively. And I just kind of started jotting down things that, you know, I wish I'd been told uh, when I was a PhD student, or I wish that were written in papers, papers and not just kind of swept under the rug. Uh, and then I organized them into these four categories. So I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit about process, I'm gonna talk a little bit about neural, neural network architectures, then also training and how to do that efficiently. And then there's kind of a, a fourth category, which is just uh, everything that didn't fit in one of these uh, first three. And throughout this, I'll try to draw some connections to some of the work that I've done over the years, as well as some other work uh, that I like. All right, so um, first let's talk about process. And I'm gonna go here for the sort of goal-driven approach to um, ML research. And what I mean by that is that the idea is to solve a particular problem as well as possible. So this is not the only valid mode of ML research. A lot of research is about understanding and sort of elucidating things. Here, we're gonna talk about, okay, we have this problem, this practical problem that we wanna solve. Uh, how do we do that as well as possible with neural networks? I'm also gonna make a very big assumption, which is that we've already established that neural networks are the right tool for the job. That's something that you should do first. Uh, sometimes you might not need a neural network. Sometimes you might not need uh, to train your own network. You might wanna use a pre-trained model, or sometimes you don't need ML at all. Um, but we're gonna assume that you've done all that due diligence and you decided that you have to train on neural networks and you want to do that um, as well as possible. So uh, the first thing to realize is that 90% of your ideas are not going to work um, and do not let that discourage you. Uh, 
And I think the best approach in general to this kind of goal-driven ML research is to try as many things as possible and to not get invested in, in one particular idea too much. Uh, it's, it's really kind of, you know, it sounds cynical, but throwing things at the wall and seeing what sticks is actually a really effective approach to train good neural networks. Uh, and if possible, you kind of want to parallelize this approach. Uh, and by that, I don't just mean like run multiple experiments in parallel, but also make sure that your hardware is always working so that you're always running something in the background and then use that, that time to not just stare at learning curves, but also uh, think about the problem and come up with new ideas. Um, the first thing you should probably do is determine what your metric's going to be. Uh, if you're tackling a new problem, um, sometimes this metric will be externally defined, which is typically the case on, on a platform like Kaggle, for example. Someone's already decided for you what metric to optimize. But often you'll have to come up with it, and it's worth sitting down and spending some time uh, to do that. Sometimes you need to kind of design it yourself, right? But you really need something that you can hill climb on. And ideally, this would be an automated metric that you can, you know, that you can compute. Um, sometimes that's not possible. Sometimes you need humans in the loop. You need human eval. And that actually makes this process quite a bit more difficult. So it can still be useful to think of some sort of automated proxy for that, even if the signal that it provides is much weaker. Um, and I, I think that's why, for example, metrics like uh, the Frechet inception distance metric, which is often used in generative modeling of images, uh, sticks around. Like People keep using it, even though we've kind of, as a community, established that it has some huge flaws. But there isn't really anything better that's computational, uh, that's simple enough that people have uh, kind of adopted. Thank you very much. Um, and the same thing ha has happened with blue in machine translation. So that's this metric that everyone reports nowadays in machine translation papers. There's actually papers from like a decade ago that go into all the problems with this metric. But despite that, we still use it because you know, you just need something to hill climb. Um, Another thing to pay attention to is that metrics and loss functions are not the same thing. So as I said, a metric is already kind of a computable proxy of what you're actually trying to achieve. It's already kind of reducing everything to uh, a single number. Uh, but a loss function on top of that has to be differentiable, right? At least if you're training neural networks, you want to backpropagate through that. Um, and so you have, that's kind of a proxy of a proxy in a sense. So you have these uh, multiple levels of proxies. Um, it's worth distinguishing the two. Um, the key thing, I think, if you're really going for raw performance is iteration speed. The one thing that you have to resist is the tendency to just make your neural network bigger, right? Because that's the thing that always works, basically. Nowadays, just throw more parameters at it, throw more compute at it, you'll get better results. You want to do that at the end, right? You want to, want to wait with that. Uh, you want to resist the urge to scale, at least initially, because scaling is the easy part up to a point. I think nowadays we're in a regime where when people talk about scaling, sometimes they mean scaling to 10 billion parameters, 100 billion parameters. That's a different game entirely. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the difference between, you know, like 50 million parameters and 500 million parameters. Um, and the, the thing that you want to optimize for is really the number of experiments that you can run. Again, harking back to this approach of like throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks. Like the best way to get most, to get uh, a lot of stuff sticking to the wall is to throw more stuff at it. So you really want to, be able to run uh, a lot of experiments. And as I said, an exception is kind of, if you're in a, if you're in a really large scale regime, if you're training large language models, this doesn't really apply there. So take that with a grain of salt. Um, another thing to do is to accept that uh, machine learning experiments produce results that are quite noisy. And typically your resources will be limited, even, even at DeepMind. <laughs> Uh, which means that repeating an experiment 10 times to get like a, a lower variance estimate of the performance is often not time well spent. It's often better to just kind of, uh, uh, a strategy that I call commit and revisit. So you just kind of make a best guess of, about whether uh, a new enhancement that you've added to your network is actually helping or not. And you just kind of go with it for a while. And then maybe later down the line, a few weeks down the line, you've tried a few other things. Your network now looks a bit different and you might want to try removing that first feature again and seeing if it's still helping you know, that kind of strategy rather than sort of trying to be certain about each decision uh, in the moment. Um, another thing that's really important is to invest in engineering. And that also means investing in your own engineering skills. Um, I think uh, Fabio is going to, talk a lot more about that tomorrow. So I'm not gonna go into that too deeply. Um, 
I just have a few tips. So you want to make sure that you're using your hardware efficiently. You know, it's it's uh, scarce uh, these days. And um, you just want to make sure you're getting 100% out of it. One thing I recommend is to use a profiler. So uh, a lot of toolboxes and, and um, libraries these days come with this built-in. So Jax has a, has a profiler that you can use to really pinpoint which parts of your model are costing the most, both for training and for, for inference. And then you can kind of focus your efforts to optimize uh, the computation uh, on those. One thing that's also very important is to not fool yourself by looking at training curves in terms of training steps. This is a mistake that I see a lot of people make, but you really want to look at uh, the training curves in terms of wall time. Like how long does it actually take you in time to get to a certain level of performance? And that's the, the way you want to be comparing models. Because often people will, uh, when they iterate on neural network architectures, they will gradually make them more complicated, right? You're, you're trying new ideas. Your ideas are more complicated than what you tried before. And in terms of steps, that will often yield a better model, but really what matters, and this is kind of the, uh, what uh, Richard Sutton calls the, the bitter lesson of, of AI, right? What really matters is how well does your model, uh, how, how well does your method scale? Um, and often the simplest things scale best. So it's really important to look at curves in terms of wall clock time. Um, and yeah, like uh, spend time optimizing your experiments. If you make each experiment 20% faster, you can run 25% more experiments in the same amount of time. Uh, and obviously this factor compounds. Um, and then as a general rule of thumb, when you're optimizing neural networks, just try to implement everything as a MATML. And I mean everything, right? Uh, that's what that's what uh, accelerators uh, excel at. So like GPUs and TPUs are really fast at doing MATMLs. So even things that aren't MATMLs uh, can often be cast in the form of a MATML. And it's, it's worth trying that to see what happens. Yeah, that's about all uh, I'll say about that. Uh, but I do want to give one example of where I applied this principle in the context of one of these Kaggle competitions. So um, there was a particular one that we participated in with our uh, with the PhD lab that I was in. Uh, and this was about classifying images of plankton. And these photographs are like grayscale photographs. And because the plankton kind of just sits there floating around in the water, the orientation is arbitrary, right? These, these things are so small that gravity doesn't really affect them. So the orientation is arbitrary. And one thing that uh, that we did that ended up helping us win this competition was um, to exploit that rotation invariance, that rotation equivariance. Uh, and so we built these network architectures that would look at the image um, in, according to, you know, with, with, rotated by different angles. And then we had this special type of layer that would then take feature maps obtained from these different rotations and then realign them and combine them together. Um, in an effort to implement uh, rotation equivariance. Um, so that's this, uh, this uh, colored thing in the middle there. Um, and what we found was during the competition, it was actually worthwhile to invest in learning some CUDA and writing a custom kernel for this. And it actually sped up training for these models by about 30%. So that was a uh, uh, time well spent. And I'm actually, I put the entire forward kernel on a slide here because it's a, it's a really simple kernel. So I spent a bit of time, like maybe a few afternoons learning about CUDA and then wrote this. Uh, and this sped up our experiments by 30%. So I, I guess what I'm saying is like, it's it's definitely worth spending some time um, uh, learning about this. Of course, you also need to implement the gradient, but that wasn't uh, much harder than this. Um, yeah, this is actually literally copied from the, from our, from the GitHub uh, link below there, which has the code uh, that we used to, to win this competition. Um, okay, so next I want to talk about um, hyperparameter optimization and sort of two different modes of exploration. So as I said, we're talking about sort of uh, soda chasing, you know, like uh, really kind of optimizing the, the performance of our neural network. And then the only thing you care about is what can I do that improves the metric? But we're also researchers and we also want to understand what's going on. So sometimes you want to focus on building understanding and ask, you, ask why does this improve the metric and how do various changes actually interact with each other? And that requires a bit of a different approach. And um, uh, especially with respect to, to hyperparameter uh, sweeping. So in general, when you're sweeping hyperparameters, you want to uh, space the values that you explore logarithmically. That's true for almost all hyperparameters in, in neural networks. And um, what people often do is they, they sweep a few hyperparameters at a time and they do a grid search, right? You kind of see what, what every possible uh, 
combination of hyperparameters does. And this is very useful, especially when you're trying to build understanding, right? When, you're, when you really want to get an idea of uh, how these hyperparameters interact. But when you're just chasing soda, actually, I would argue that random search is often a better choice. Um, and there's this paper from about a decade ago that, uh, that kind of extols this. And I have this really nice figure that I wanted to show. So often, if you have a set of hyperparameters that affect your model, um, quite a few of them actually won't do that much, just as a general rule of thumb. But you might not know beforehand which ones are actually, like which ones actually influence performance and which ones don't. And so the thing that random search gives you is that uh, the subset of parameters that actually do matter will be sampled more densely if you do random search. Uh, than, than if you do a, a, a grid layout. Um, and uh, random search is also trivially parallelizable. Uh, you know, there's, there's more advanced hyperparameter optimization algorithms, you know, like Bayesian uh, mechanisms. But in general, I find that random search, because it's so easy to implement and so easy to parallelize, that that's just the way to go. So something to keep in mind. All right, so uh, that's all the stuff I have for process. So now let's talk about uh, neural network architectures. Um, and we're going to skip the basics, right? I'm assuming that you've all heard of linear layers, uh, various kinds of nonlinearities, convolutions and pooling, recurrence, and nowadays attention, I think, can also be considered um, one of these base components. Uh, I'm also not really going to talk about how to best initialize your model because most frameworks kind of do that for you. It's one, one thing I want to say, though, is that it's worth understanding the heuristic that these uh, uh, that that is typically used for this, which is to preserve unit variance, right? So you kind of assume that your input is uh, unit variance, and then the way you initialize the weights of each layer is to ensure that all the intermediate activations preserve that unit variance. And this is done to uh, ensure numerical stability during training. Um, so still quite basic, I guess, but sort of um, an, a, a very important idea is this idea of residual connections in neural networks. Um, it's really interesting because I just didn't exist during my PhD. We didn't do this. And now it's just so obvious that this is what you should do. Um, so basically just add a skip connection every few layers. Uh, I would argue that this is one of the simplest and most effective tricks in, in all of neural network design, maybe tied with dropout in terms of payoff versus simplicity. Um, and yeah, so we do this to ensure good gradient flow through the network. And it's basically... It was an essential component for us to be able to start training networks that were deeper than about 10 layers or so. Um, there's a few sort of modern variants of this that I want to highlight. So one thing that people have started doing more recently is when you whenever you have a residual connection, uh, when you add the sort of the residual together with the with the pass through, uh, divide the result by square root of two. And this is exactly because of this uh, variance preservation that I just mentioned in the context of initialization, like to, to preserve the variance throughout the network when you add Think, when you add two things with variance one together, the sum will have variance two. So if you divide by a square root of two, you compensate for that. Um, and another strategy here is to just initialize the residual to zero, which is also uh, gaining popular popularity uh, nowadays. But you should probably do one of the two. Um, I also want to talk about normalization layers. Uh, so there's a lot of variants. You've got batch norm, layer norm, group norm, instance norm, RMS norm. I'm sure I'm missing out a bunch more, but they all follow kind of the same pattern, which is that they take some activations uh, from a layer in your network X, they estimate some mean and some standard deviation and then standardize the activations. And then you have uh, uh, sort of learnable linear parameters, A and B, to, um, to change the, to basically do a shifting and, and scaling operation on the result. Um, and the difference between all these different types of normalization layers is basically how you compute mu and sigma. Whether you do that across the batch dimension, then you get batch norm, or across the channel dimension, then you get layer norm, or uh, group norm if you first, decide, uh, first divide the channels into different groups and then do normalization within each group. Uh, you can also do it over space and time. That's called instance norm. There's a variant of layer norm called RMS norm where you don't uh, subtract the mean. Um, and um, so batch norm, I think, is maybe the, the variant that was most commonly used in vision models until recently. Uh, layer norm is, of course, what's what's used in transformers. Um, one thing to consider is that normalization can go before or after linear operations, and this this matters. So I would say this is maybe the 
the only significant thing that has changed about transformers since they were introduced in 2017 is where you put the layer norms. So in the original version, they put the layer norms after the residual addition. And then um, some people, in, uh, multiple groups independently actually found that moving these layer norms to before the attention blocks and right before the MLP blocks, uh, but kind of moving them out of the residual channel actually uh, helped training in some sense, because now your residual channel is just purely uh, an, an identity function, essentially. So gradient propagation is improved. It's apparently not um, a clear win. Like there, there are apparently some situations where you still want to use uh, the original version, which personally, I don't, I don't fully understand. But uh, just to mention that this is a thing that you should consider. Um, one thing also to note is that batch norm is falling out of favor. So uh, batch norm was kind of uh, indispensable for uh, a lot of time. I would say from about 2014-ish, um, I think, when it was introduced to like maybe 2020. Um, basically, every model had batch norm. And I, I really didn't like it because batch norm introduces a lot of technical debt. So you have, first of all, you have this inter, uh, sorry, not inter, intra-batch dependency where the, the mean and the standard deviation that you normalize your activations by depend on other examples in the batch. I think that's a little bit nasty. I, I don't like that. Um, one advantage of that is that it acts as a kind of regularizer because you kind of inject a bit of stochasticity um, into training based on the composition of the batch. But the strength of that regularization is dependent on the batch size, which introduces this unpleasant dependency, which is not nice. And then, of course, at test time, you still need a, a, a mu and a sigma to normalize by, but you don't necessarily have a full batch to calculate these statistics from. So batch norm is also usually stateful in the sense that these statistics are tracked over the course of training. And this statefulness in particular is a huge bug magnet. There's so many bugs that end up being batch norm bugs. So if you can avoid batch norm, I strongly recommend that you do. Um, I mean, it, it was a it was a huge innovation at the time, uh, you know, made a huge impact. But I think at this point, we're at a point where if we can avoid it, we should probably do that. Um, all right. In the context of uh, transformers, I also want to highlight flash attention as something that's worth paying attention to. So this is quite new, um, but uh, it's a very, very valuable uh, tool when you're training uh, transformers especially. And I think it's also worth understanding how it works because it's quite elegant. So the key idea of flash attention is if you take attention, uh, you have this product of the queries and the keys that determine basically the weights, the, the attention weights. And this matrix can be quite large because it's usually sequence length by sequence length, right? Um, and the key idea of flash attention is that you don't actually ever need to fully compute this matrix in practice. You can compute it one tile at a time. Now, you might ask, how is that possible? Because, of course, when you compute a softmax, you need to normalize that softmax somehow. Uh, but it turns out there is actually an algorithm to compute that incrementally, tile by tile. And it's actually quite elegant. It's quite, uh, quite easy to understand. I'm not going to go in, into it in detail. I'm just flagging that you should look into this because it's, it's worth understanding. Um, and then another thing that flash attention does is rather than sort of keeping track of these tiles, it just kind of discards them. And then in the backward pass, it recomputes them because it turns out that recomputing these tiles is actually cheaper than storing them in memory and loading them from memory, at least for, for our current hardware, for our GPUs and also for TPUs. And this is called rematerialization. So this is like a very useful uh, term to know as well. Uh, um, and so you get speed ups from flash attention, both due to the fact that you can kind of combine all these operations into a single CUDA kernel, but also from the memory savings. So when you, when you save memory, you can actually also get speed ups on GPUs because compute is faster than loading stuff from memory. And that's also an important principle to uh, remember. Um, another useful uh, transformer specific trick is QK normalization. So it was um, introduced recently in this uh, uh, VID22B paper where they train a vision transformer with 22 billion parameters. Um, and they find that in this regime, when you have so many parameters, there's all these kind of new instabilities that crop up. This is why I said earlier, you know, like uh, once you enter this kind of uh, order of magnitude in terms of parameters, things change a bit. You know, things it's 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 more uncharted territory, I guess. Um, so uh, with very large models, you have these logits in your attention mechanism that grow to extreme values that causes training instability. Uh, and they actually found in this paper that all you have to do to fix this is just put layer norm on the on the uh, the queries and the keys. That's it. 
I, I just thought this was a very um, elegant analysis and an, uh, an elegant solution uh, to this problem. So I wanted to uh, point that out. Um, another thing that uh, I think is kind of a thread through my work, but it's also more useful generally, is to exploit the uh, topology and the symmetry of the problem that you're trying to use neural networks for by adapting the architecture of the model to that. So um, there's uh, obviously like there's models for structured data. We know that if we have sequences, transformers make sense. If we have images, we might want to use convolutions. Same thing for video. If you have graphs, there's graph neural networks. Someone else has already talked about that at length, I believe. Um, I want to highlight uh, some interesting variants of this. So group uh, group convolutions are this idea of extending convolutions beyond just a translation group. Like if you have rotation invariants, you might want to exploit that in your network. So that's what we did in the context of these Kaggle competitions as well. Uh, and the, sort of the two keywords to keep an eye on are equivariance and invariance. So equivariance is when um, when you uh, apply some group action to the input of your network, for example, rotation, the same thing happens to the output. Um, so this makes sense, for example, for let's say you have a model uh, that does image segmentation, then if you rotate the image, you would expect the segmentation map to rotate in the same way. And then invariance is a special case of that where the output actually doesn't change, where it's invariant to the rotation of the input. Um, so equivariance is kind of a, a keyword to look into here. Uh, one thing I also want to mention in this context is that transformers don't actually have any topological inductive bias. Right? So convolutions kind of make assumptions about how your input is topologically structured. Transformers make no such assumptions. They basically treat the input as a set. And what's cool about that is that you can uh, induce uh, topological biases with embeddings. Right? So you have positional embeddings, which are the most common form of this. But you can use other types of embeddings to kind of uh, make clear to the model that there are certain relationships between the different uh, uh, components of the set that you're giving it. So transformer models aren't really a sequence model per se, they're actually a set model. And then we turn it into a sequence model uh, by adding these embeddings. Um, yeah, I have a few examples of this principle uh, in the context of some work that I did. So I've already briefly mentioned this work on galaxy morphology prediction. So what we did there uh, was basically take the same continent and then apply it 16 times to different um, rotations and crops uh, from the input image. And then we had kind of a subnetwork that would aggregate the information from all these uh, networks together and then uh, produce uh, class predictions. Um, and that was kind of a precursor to what we then did in the context of the plankton identification competition, where we kind of took this a step further and really tried to build completely equivariant networks. And this kind of roughly coincided with uh, some of the work that Taco Cohen um, at Amsterdam University was doing on this topic. And he ended up, we actually both ended up writing ICML papers about this topic. Um, uh, so he kind of specialized in this and, and um, kind of seeded the field of, of equivariant uh, models. Uh, with these ideas. Another example of sort of exploiting the topology of the input is uh, WaveNet actually. So in WaveNet, what we set out to do was build a generative model of raw audio. And the way raw audio is typically stored uh, digitally is as a very long one-dimensional sequence. Basically, you, you kind of quantize the waveform into these amplitude values and you just have a sequence of these amplitude values to model. Um, and we wanted to model that with uh, with convolutions. And so what we ended up doing was use dilation. So we kind of, uh, we have these dilated convolutions and we increase the dilation rate. Uh, we basically double it uh, for every layer. And this gives you a way to build convolutional neural networks whose receptive field uh, grows exponentially with depth rather than linearly. Um, and, and this turned out to be a very uh, efficient way to model uh, audio waveforms, at least at training time. At test time, the sampling was a bit slow, but we fixed that in the later paper. Um, cool. Um, I also want to talk a bit about information bottlenecks in neural networks because you will very frequently encounter these uh, nowadays. Often we want to kind of constrain the capacity of a particular layer in the networks because we want to use it. We want to use the representation for a, for a downstream task, for example. So there's a bunch of variants for this. Uh, um, there's Gumbel softmax, there's uh, vector quantization as in VQVAE. Uh, you can also just uh, put a KL penalty on the activations and then you get essentially a regular VAE. Um, there's something called Gecko, which I wanna highlight, which is a very nice way to kind of uh, 
target a particular inf uh, information rate um, in, in your representation by adaptively changing the weight of the penalty as you go along uh, through training. Uh, and that actually we used as inspiration uh, for some work, which I'll talk about in a bit. So I, I want to specifically highlight vector quantization because uh, that one is uh, quite common, uh, quite commonly used nowadays. Uh, the idea there is that you have uh, at some layer in your no neural network, you'd have basically a kind of running k-means constantly trying to uh, learn uh, k-means representation of the activations in your network. And then in the forward pass of your network, you just clamp the activations to the nearest mean. And then in the backward pass, you just pretend that you didn't do that and you just backpropagate as before. That's called straight through estimation. And it turns out this is a really nice way to learn discrete representations of neural networks. This is a very useful tool. Uh, to have in your toolbox. Um, right, so I wanted to highlight this particular example uh, that I worked on, which was about variable rate representation learning. So what I was trying to do was take sequences, speech signals, and learn discrete representations that kind of grow and shrink uh, depending on how much uh, salient information there is actually in these speech signals. Um, and we did that with a slowness penalty. So we basically penalized the representation for changing too fast by saying that in most cases, the uh, the value of the represent the value of a feature should be the same from one time step to the next. And what we found was that this slowness penalty was actually very very sensitive to the weight uh, that it was given in the loss function. Uh, so here are sort of um, three different examples of representations learned with different weights for this for this slowness penalty. And so you can see that even between one like varying this parameter by one order of magnitude between one and ten gives usually different results. And so this is where we took inspiration from, from Gecko and said, well, let's just uh, target a particular uh, information rate and then adapt Lambda automatically over the course of training uh, to target that particular rate. Because sweeping this is going to be too expensive. We're going to have to try too many different values. And this actually worked really well. So here you see an example of such a training run where uh, so Lambda is initialized to one. And then we measure the, the kind of information rate of this representation. And you can see it kind of spikes initially, but then quickly settles in at the target rate, which in this case was 75 hertz, I think. And you can also see that this lambda kind of evolves in an interesting way, where at first it kind of exponentially grows. And then as soon as the target rate is hit, it kind of gradually uh, relaxes. So the penalty is kind of relaxed so that the network can learn a more efficient representation. Um, yet another example with a discrete bottleneck is Piano Genie. Uh, it's one of my favorite examples, actually. So this is an internship project by Chris Donahue at Magenta, which I co-supervised. And here, uh, the goal was basically to do something like Guitar Hero, but for piano, where you have a piano keyboard, but it actually only has eight buttons. But you want those eight buttons to be kind of responding intuitively to what people are doing with them. So basically, people would press the buttons and something vaguely musical sounding would come out. And you would want to be uh, the case that if people press a button to the right, then the pitch would go up. If people press a button to the left, then a the pitch would go down so that it feels like uh, a, a piano keyboard to some, to some extent. Um, and we ended up achieving that with a, a, with a discrete bottleneck, which is actually using scalar quantization rather than vector quantization, because we wanted to have this ordinality. Um, and um, yeah, so we, we use a combination of different loss functions to kind of enforce that this discrete representation would kind of roughly track uh, the shape of the of the melody uh, within sort of the constraints of only having eight buttons. Um, and there's actually so there's a there's some YouTube videos of Chris actually using this to play on a grand piano, which are very cool. Uh, so uh, you can check that out if you're interested. Um, right. Uh, so then, last thing I want to talk about with respect to architecture is the concept of iterative refinement as sort of um, a very powerful tool that's come to the forefront in recent years. So especially in the concept of generative modeling, uh, we actually need really, really deep networks. We, really, we need really deep computation graphs to do that effectively. And um, people have come up with approaches to kind of divide and conquer. So rather than uh, training a neural network to generate, uh, for example, a complicated image in one go, what you can do is split the modeling task into multiple steps, which are easier to solve individually. Um, and when you train a model to solve those individual steps, what you're actually doing is you're training a very deep computation graph, but without backpropagating through the whole thing. So it's a way to essentially sidestep uh, 
backpropagation where backpropagation would be too expensive. And autoregression and diffusion are actually two instances of the same principle. So in autoregression, the step that you learn is essentially how to predict one sequence element given previous sequence elements. And then this composes uh, to be a model of, of full sequences. Uh, in diffusion, you do something similar, but by uh, gradually corrupting the input by adding noise and then learning how to invert that process step by step. And again, what, during sampling, you kind of unroll this and you have a very deep computation graph, which consists of hundreds of invocations of your of your diffusion model. So I think this is a very powerful concept um, that's worth, it, not just in generative modeling in general, I think it's just worth thinking about whether that's an option for your problem. Right, um, let's talk about uh, training. So first of all, optimizers. My general advice is, unless you have a very good reason not to, you should start with Adam, and you might just wanna stick with Adam. Adam's really good. Um, I would say even the default parameters are pretty good. So Andre Karpathy has some opinions about what the best learning rate is. Um, I, I usually use 2e minus four actually, but 3e minus four is fine. Um, one thing to highlight here, and this is something that I think people have started realizing in the community recently is that at scale, when you're using Atom, uh, the most important hyperparameter to tune is actually beta two and not the learning rate. So beta two is this um, essentially this forgetting factor for the second moment that Atom estimates. Uh, and it really helps to turn that down a bit. So I think the default value is like 0.999 with three nines, turning that down to 0.99 or even 0.9 can make a real difference when you're training at scale. And also interestingly, when you're training uh, adversarial networks, Get generative adversarial networks out of the box are kind of a little bit more unstable and and tuning this parameter can really help uh make that a little bit less painful uh adam also has this epsilon hyperparameter um you know on in the denominator that uh, looks like it's there just for numerical stability but actually it's worth tuning because it interpolates between uh sort of like the proper adam algorithm and a more standard um uh, momentum algorithm. So this is a, this is a hyperparameter that you should actually do. Uh, and in general, my opinion is that exotic optimizers, their benefits are often quite application specific, and they often disappear at scale. So this is one of the things that I spend usually the least time tweaking. I usually just stick with Adam, and that tends to work. It, there's there's some cases where you maybe want to use sort of standard uh, nestor of momentum to really get sort of the the last uh, bit of performance out of your model. But in general, sticking with Adam is a safe bet. Uh, I, also, I should also talk a little bit about learning rate schedules. Oh, you have a question? Should I, should I hand you this microphone? I think it's on already. Oh, there's another one. There's two microphones heading your way. Yeah, sorry. Uh, sorry for interruption. Before no, no, please, to... please interrupt. I should have start, said this at the start, actually. Yeah, please interrupt me. Yeah. Okay, it may be a uh, simple question, but is this specific to Adam or also Adam W? I mean, uh, because Adam W usually use it with weight decay for regularization. So should I stick to Adam instead? Uh, no, that's a very good point. Yeah, I think in, I guess, sorry, this is maybe a little bit unclear, but yeah, in general, Adam W, I feel has kind of replaced Adam as kind of the, the default. And yeah, definitely if you're, if you're doing weight decay, which is also an if, <laughs> If you're doing that, Adam W is the way to go. That's a that's a very good point. Thank you. Thank you very much. That one's not working. Hello. Oh no. It's... Okay. Super quick question. Uh, when you say at scale tuning beta two is important, uh, what scale are we talking about? I, I'm talking about like when you're when you're going into the regime of like billions of parameters then that becomes helpful. But as I said, also some other classes of models like adversarial neural networks, even if they're much smaller, can benefit from this. Like it's, I think in general with Adam, people have a tendency to tune the learning rate and not these other parameters, but actually this one in my experience is more important to tune than the learning rate. All of this is of course highly subjective. Uh, what do you make of Adam in case where the domain shifts or the data distribution shifts because it has this momentum factor? That's a very good point. I am not really qualified to answer that. For example, I have never worked on RL problems, <laughs> which I guess are a canonical example of that. Uh, so I don't know if my advice applies there. Nice t-shirt, by the way. So one question is how 
would you go about in practice tuning the epsilon parameter because it's in the order of uh, 10 minus 8 or something so yeah so again like uh, i would say exponentially spaced uh, values so like try 10 minus probably the first thing i would try is like one 10 e, like e minus 2 e minus 4 e minus 6 e minus 8 so order of magnitude yeah 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 yep. yeah I, in general that's like Two orders of yeah, it it kind of depends on the parameter, but in general, orders of magnitude are, are what you would do. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. All right, I'll continue. Uh, I think, but I'm very happy to take more questions. Oh, there's there's maybe one more. Okay, one more, and then I'll continue for a bit, and then we can take. Have two. You can have two questions. That's <laughs> it. I'm gonna go back a um, couple of slides. Um, so you you talked about iterative refinement, and uh, then how yes. how you need to break down your tasks into subtasks, or, or at least this is my understanding. Um, do you break them into subtasks and, and train them sequentially? And then if yes, how would you do for the for the labels? Do you create synthetically kind of uh, labels for sub labels for each subtask? So this this technique is maybe more obviously applicable in the context of generative modeling where you can do exactly what you described like when you train a diffusion model you kind of artificially add noise to your training examples and then you try to denoise them right so that's that's how you're kind of creating these different subtasks one thing also to note there is that even though we're creating these different subtasks we're still using one and the same model to try and solve all of them um, so it doesn't necessarily imply that you have to train separate models for each for each subtask but um it's definitely worth thinking about if you have a a different type of problem, maybe that's not generative modeling, like how could we do something similar? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 I think it's very problem dependent. But the, the key thing to, I think, take away from this is that it often pays to um, find ways to avoid having to backdrop to really deep computation graphs. Got it. Um, then my second question will be about batch norm. Um, at some point, you said it is stateful and it has a problem with test time. And then you you mentioned something about bugs. Um, could you just give us like what kind like examples of bugs, for example, and how does that relate to test time? And what so, is the stateful thing? Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. So, um, so in general, neural network frameworks are built for gradient descent. Right. So, and in a sense, that's already a form of state, right? You have these, your parameters and you're updating them, and that's your state carries over. Now, what, what batch norm does is it introduces a different kind of state, which is not updated using the optimizer, right? It's often, it's updated using some other algorithm. That already breaks a lot of assumptions in some frameworks, like, uh, or requires you to use certain mechanisms. Like, for example, in the Haiku library that we tend to use to build neural networks at DeepMind, there is a special, uh, uh, sort of type of state, like it's literally called state in the library that you have to use to handle this. And uh, the way mistakes creep into this is that you might, um, it might not be updating, for example. This was a huge problem in TensorFlow, like you would implement batch norm and then it turns out that you didn't sort of include the update operation for your state in the graph and then it would just never update. But you wouldn't notice that until the end of training, right? That, that kind of thing. So. Um, it's maybe not the best example, but there's a lot of uh, examples. Maybe actually, so maybe you should ask that guy. Uh, <laughs> he seems to have had a bad experience with with batch norm bugs. So I'm sure he can give you some examples. Um, yeah, it's just in general, anything that introduces extra state um, is uh, a bit painful. And in fact, actually, uh, the standard implementation of vector quantization also does this, right? You also suddenly have this uh, set of means for k-means that's being updated with a with a, an update rule that's not the same as uh, the way your network parameters are updated. And so that's also something to be wary of when you're using BQ, that that is happening correctly. Got it, thanks. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna continue for a bit and then I'm happy to take some more questions as we go along. Uh, where do we get to? Right, I was talking about Adam. Yeah, these Adam uh, learning rate schedules, right? So uh, there's a few different ways to do learning rate schedules, but you should always do it. Like, don't get tempted to just kind of keep your learning rate constant because you're going to have bad time. You're going to leave a lot of performance 
on the table if you do that. Um, when I was doing my PhD, the tradition was kind of to do discrete drops. So you would just have a constant learning rate for a while. And then at some point during training, you would drop it by 10x and then do that a few times. And that's why you would get these learning curves uh, like the ones on the right here. These are actually taken from the, the residual networks paper. So you get these huge drops in, in error rates whenever you do that, which, which really shows that it's important to drop the learning rate. It's kind of critical for performance. I think nowadays a very popular schedule is the cosine schedule because uh, it doesn't have too many hyperparameters, kind of achieves the same thing. Uh, in the context of transformers, you also want to do some warm up sometimes. Like you don't want the learning rate to be too high at the start because then uh, you might end up with instabilities. But in general, the principle is kind of that you, you're doing this uh, high dimensional optimization. And at the start, you want a high learning rate because you want to explore the space. But as you kind of hone in on the best place to be, you want to lower your learning rate. You kind of, kind of want to lower the temperature of exploration to really sort of find the absolute best point. And this really matters. So like, don't, don't skimp on this. Make sure that you schedule uh, at least the learning rate. Uh, another very useful trick in this bag is uh, tracking an exponential moving average of your parameters. I think this is uh, always worth a try. It's particularly useful actually for generative models, uh, especially uh, GANs and diffusion models benefit hugely from this. In fact, there's a paper called Improved Techniques for Training Score-Based Generative Models, one of the earlier diffusion papers. And one of the three sort of improved techniques that they that they uh, suggest is use EMA. You have to use EMA. It works so much better. And uh, there's some plots from the from the paper on the right that show just how much of an impact uh, using this exponential moving average of your parameters instead of the instantaneous values uh, has. One thing to consider is that this comes with a significant memory cost because you have to store an extra copy of the parameters. Um, so sometimes it's not worth the trade-off. I think that's why this is less common, for example, in language modeling, where we really just want to push scale and then having this extra copy of the parameters just gets in the way. Um, also, briefly want to talk about uh, scaling across devices. When you have the luxury to be able to do that, um, it's worth thinking about what kind of parallelism you want to use uh, and how you want to potentially shard your model into multiple parts. So uh, usually you, you're just going to want to do data parallelism, which is just to split up the batch, the training batch into multiple parts and then have different devices work on different parts. And then all you have to do is just um, average the gradients together. Most modern frameworks support this out of the box. So it's arguably the easiest way to benefit from training on multiple devices. And it's, I would say it's usually good enough for anything that's like on the order of up to billions of parameters. Once you get in a range of ten, tens of billions, it becomes harder to fit models into single devices, of course. Um, I would, I think also what's interesting is that um, model parallelism is starting to get easier. So actually splitting up your model parameters across multiple devices is starting to get easier. There's, uh, there's things like JAX.pget, which kind of try to make this easier for you. I think I see some parallels between this evolution and what was happening with automatic differentiation during my PhD. So at the start of my PhD, I was still manually implementing my gradients. Uh, and then I started using Theano, which supported auto diff, and that was kind of a revelation and made new things possible. I think this is now happening with model parallelism. So we're starting to have these tools. They're still a little bit primitive, but people are working on them and they're gonna get a lot better. So it's gonna be a lot easier to train large models on uh, multiple devices. Um, as a rule of thumb, when you're doing model parallelism, you wanna minimize communication across devices. And I'll, I'll show an example of this in a bit. Uh, on, another thing to consider is micro batching which is kind of like data parallelism, but in time. So you, rather than sort of updating your model at every step, you actually accumulate uh, uh, weight updates over multiple micro batches and then average them together before applying them to the parameters. And this seems kind of counterintuitive, but sometimes averaging together a few updates before applying them can actually work better uh, than, uh, than updating at every step. So I wanted to show this example of uh, what's called Megatron sharding. This is like one of the most common ways to do uh, model sharding over multiple devices. And this is specifically useful in the context of transformers, which have these two layer MLPs in them. And ultimately what you wanna do is minimize communication, right? So what people figured out is that it's actually beneficial to shard the two layers of your MLP in different ways. So the first layer you wanna shard on the output so that the, the hiddens of your MLP end up separated, like split in two parts over the different devices. Because then in the second layer, you can actually shard across the input dimension. And then the outputs will again uh, be replicated uh, across every device like the inputs were. And the nice thing about this is that the hiddens, 
never need to be communicated between the devices. So you're kind of minimizing uh, communication by doing this. Um, another very useful thing that I think I already briefly mentioned is rematerialization. So this idea that on GPUs, memory is slower than compute. Uh, so sometimes recomputing things is actually faster than fetching from memory. And even if it's not faster, sometimes it's just worth the memory savings to try and fit your model um, in, the, in the GPU memory. Uh, so JAX actually does this out of the box to some extent, uh, but you can also have fine grained control over it using JAX.remat. Uh, and definitely if you're running into memory issues, this is one of the first things to try. And sometimes it can make your models faster, which is weird, but it's cool. Um, Another way to make training faster or to fit larger models is uh, low precision arithmetic. So you could try training in half precision. Um, I do not have the best experiences with this personally, but it's getting better. Like the tooling is getting better. Uh, so you can uh, basically store your model weights in half precision, two bytes instead of four bytes, which is the usual, your usual size. And then obviously that saves you half the memory. Uh, but it also introduces more potential for numerical stability. Um, so there's all kinds of tricks like rescaling on the fly during training or uh, a, a very interesting one here is stochastic rounding actually so rather than sort of always uh rounding these these values to the nearest um value in the in the, in the smaller representation doing this stochastically can actually uh, uh quite uh, significantly stabilize training um and then also related to this is quantization um so you can quantize model weights currently this is mostly done uh, as a post-processing step so you train either in full precision or half precision, and then you quantize after the fact to make your model smaller so that you can serve it more efficiently or something like that. Um, you can do quantization on the weights or the activations or both. And the main challenge there uh, that hasn't really been solved yet is outliers. So um, usually the activation distributions have long tails. So the most of the activations will be kind of well behaved, and then there will be a few outliers there with sort of fairly large values or fairly negative values. And um, the problem is that if you want to quantize the activations, you have to be able to quantize the entire range of values. And so these outliers kind of make it hard to have enough precision where it matters. Um, and so often in, in, in current approaches, these are treated separately. So uh, there's sort of a separate channel that's, that's computed in full precision uh, just to take care of these outliers, which um, is a bit cumbersome. So a lot of research is currently going into how do we actually eliminate these outliers altogether so that we don't have to deal with them anymore. Um, and I haven't seen a lot of it yet in the wild, but I think quantized training, so actually training with these quantized representations like in eight and in four is actually uh, on the rise. And maybe in a matter of years, that's what we'll all be doing. Um, so yeah, I wanted to uh, highlight this example from this recent paper called Quantizable Transformers. They had identified this issue in uh, transformers where Sometimes the transformer wants to do nothing. Like sometimes it wants to take the activations from the previous layer and just copy them to the next layer. And it cannot do that because uh, there's a softmax uh, in the attention mechanism and softmax weights cannot all be zero, right? They have to sum to one. So basically it cannot learn uh, the, uh, the identity there. And it turns out that it finds a workaround. And the workaround it finds is put a lot of probability mass on parts of the input that are not salient. Like for example, in text, they find that uh, the model will use punctuation for this. And then in images, uh, this is the, the, the example that I'm showing on the slide. So in images, it finds patches of the image where there's not much going on. And then that's where it puts all the weight. Uh, so obviously it's, this is not desirable, right? It's working around the limitation of the model. And so the paper suggests a few fixes, uh, but there's this blog post that actually suggests another fix, which is to just add a zero logit to your softmax logits so that um, the model can always put weight on that zero logit um, if it wants to uh, uh, output uh, zero softmax weights. And of course, the, 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 the goal of all this is to eliminate these outlier uh, activations so that the model becomes more easy to quantize. Right. Um, so last section of the talk, um, I just have a few loose thoughts here, things that I want to mention. So first of all, scaling laws. So um, this is kind of new. Um, you know, like models have grown a lot larger over the past few years and big models are very expensive to iterate on. So people have started actually treating this as a science and sort of trying to predict what will happen 
when you scale up a model. That's that's what scaling models are. Um, and this is important and this is good, but it's still important to be wary of the fact that training behavior can change quite dramatically with every sort of order of magnitude increase. And your scaling laws will not necessarily capture that. So one example of that is uh, once you go to the 100 billion parameter regime, usually you're training on a lot of devices in parallel. And one thing that suddenly becomes relevant is cosmic radiation that starts flipping bits in the chips. You know, like you, know, you get unlucky and a cosmic ray hits the chip in just the right space to, to flip a bit and you get NANDs. And this is something that, you know, we mostly don't have to worry about when training neural networks. But when you, when you go to these uh, sort of 100 billion parameter regimes, this is suddenly something you have to care about. And obviously your scaling law will not predict that. Um, distillation is a very powerful technique that's worth learning about and worth using. So you can use it for different things. Uh, the idea is to take um, a train model and use its predictions and then have another model try to match those predictions rather than training the new model from scratch on the on the data set. Um, so you have, a, you have a teacher model and a student model, essentially. You can use that to reduce model size, so you can make the student smaller than the teacher. Um, but a very cool result from 2018 that I wanted to mention is this uh, paper called Born Again Neural Networks, but it distilled the model into a same size model, so exactly the same architecture, and that works better somehow. Um, it's a very interesting paper, I just want to mention that. And then another cool thing you can do with distillation is actually completely change the architecture of your model. There's still a, a transform it into an RNN, for example. Um, and I wanted to give an example from my own work where we use distillation uh, for another reason. So this is this idea of learning uh, discrete representations of images, but specifically representations that uh, do not capture the local correlation structure of images, but only look at larger scale correlations. So in images, usually the pixels that are very nearby are very correlated. So those are kind of easy to predict, but the interesting structure in images is in the correlations that are sort of longer distances. So we train the model first, uh, we train this teacher model with an image where certain patches are masked out, and then we try to predict the middle pixel. And so for that, the model has to rely on pixels that are further away. And this gives you um, internal representations that are kind of capturing the, the larger scale correlation structure of images. Uh, and we wanted to actually learn a discrete representation of entire images, but obviously this would be very expensive to get from a model like this because you'd have to basically mask every possible spatial position in the image and then infer the features um, sequentially. So what we did was we used distillation to distill this teacher model into a new model that always sees the full image as input without any masking. But it's thought to match the predictions of the teacher model, which gets the masked input. So it's still going to learn to predict stuff that depends on these longer range correlations in the image. Um, and then what we did was we put a VQ bottleneck in this model, vector quantization, to, to get discrete features that sort of um, are uh, basically more compressible than uh, features that you would get from a standard uh, VQ VAE. And in fact, so the, the, uh, the plot on the right shows this. So if we just have the feed forward model, which is just a standard VQ VAE, you get these features uh, that, um, are compressible to a certain level, but then the blue curve shows that if you do this thing, where you kind of eliminate the local correlations from the images first, you get features that are that are much more compressible in terms of bits per dimension. So this is a sort of a, a slightly unusual application of distillation. Um, uh, Autodiff is a luxury. So Autodiff, as I said, was kind of something that started appearing when I was doing my PhD. It's very very powerful. Uh, and often you don't really have to think about what goes on anymore with, with gradients, but sometimes you do. So it's like worth understanding what actually goes under the hood, goes on under the hood with Autodiff, uh, just to be able to roughly estimate the computational cost of training your model and also uh, to help with debugging. Um, so another thing I wanna warn about is Autodiff makes it possible to do all these cool tricks with higher order gradients. But one thing to keep in mind is that um, neural networks are mostly linear. So we think of neural networks as these highly nonlinear objects, but actually in most of their domain, they're pretty much linear. And what that means is that if you try to take second order gradients, you're gonna get very sparse outputs because they're gonna be mostly zero because any linear function has a second order gradient of zero. Uh, and so this can cause a lot of difficulties when you're trying to, when you're trying to do, um, when you're trying to train models with loss functions that involve higher order gradients of your, of your model, for example, something to watch out for. Incidentally, this is also why uh, diffusion models these days, 
are parameterized to, uh, you know, they, they tend to be units that predict gradients of the log likelihood with respect to the input. So they're, they're parameterized to predict the gradient. Uh, and so one could think, why, why not parameterize a kind of one dimensional energy function and then take the gradient of that and say like, that's your diffusion model. So people have run these comparisons and actually uh, in general, it seems like the consensus has been that we should just predict these gradients directly to avoid having to do gradients gradients uh, during training. Um, I posted this somewhat controversial tweet a while ago <laughs> where I was suggesting that um, when you're implementing a neural network, you should just sprinkle epsilons everywhere. In particular, um, if you're doing any kind of division in your neural network, you wanna add a tiny epsilon under there. If you have a square root in your network, you wanna add a tiny epsilon under there. Um, and the reason is just to avoid division by zero, right? Because at some point your input activations will become zero and then you're gonna run into problems. So uh, this is obvious with the first example. With the second example, this is because if you take the, the, the derivative of a, of a square root, that square root moves into the denominator. And so then you get um, uh, division by zero in the gradient. So this is why I was saying when you're doing automatic differentiation, it's actually still worth understanding what, what's actually going on there. Because otherwise you wouldn't know how to how to debug something like this. So anyway, yeah, sprinkle epsilons. It upset some theoreticians when I said this, but it's it's just what I do in practice. And it it really bothered me that it took me so long to figure out that everyone was doing this because they left out the epsilons in the formulas that they put in the papers, right? But they are there. When you look at the implementations, they are there. So yeah, sprinkle epsilons. Um and then finally, the last thing I want to mention is this intuition that, so I already said neural networks are mostly linear. Another thing is that neural networks have low Lipschitz constants. And what I mean by that is, uh, so with a Lipschitz constant of a function f of x, basically says roughly, this is a hand wavy definition, but like if x changes by an amount delta, then f of x changes by at most c times delta, and c is the Lipschitz constant, right? So if your uh, Lipschitz constant c is small, then it's not possible for f of x to be highly nonlinear, to learn very, very nonlinear functions at the input. And so this is generally true for neural networks. Um, they, they are nonlinear, but they're not that nonlinear. So it's, it's hard to learn these very, very nonlinear functions. And so there's a few workarounds that people have come up with uh, to help with that. So for example, uh, positional encodings are sometimes used uh, uh, to achieve this because positional encodings consist of these sines and cosines which are highly nonlinear functions. So if you pre-process your uh, input to your neural network that you want to learn the highly nonlinear function of with these positional encodings, then suddenly the network becomes able to learn these uh, more complicated functions. Uh, random Fourier features are also used for this purpose. So this is also used, for example, in diffusion models. You tend to condition your diffusion model on the time step so that the model is aware of how much noise there is going to be in the input. And that's where you want to use one of these uh, you know, sin sinusoidal or cosine uh, representations so that the model can learn to change its behavior uh, depending on the level of noise in the input. Um, there's another option, which is to actually replace all your activation functions by signs, but that uh, leads to a whole other uh, set of complications. But that's what they did in the, in the SIREN paper, for example, uh, for uh, learning implicit representations of images. Uh, and then if, if you want to go the other way, if you want to enforce a uh, certain level of Lipschitzness of your model. There's there's a, a technique called spectral normalization, which is often used in uh, adversarial uh, training, which is also worth looking into in that case. Okay, um, I think I'm gonna stop and answer some questions. Thank you very much for listening to me. Um,